What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? What's stop, what's stop? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? What's stop, what's stop? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. If you've got a question about the Catholic faith, we would love to get that question answered for you once and for all. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Outside North America, please dial 1 and then 205 271 2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 58177. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. If you're watching us on TV today, you can participate as well. The address is for that is uh, CTC at EWTN.com, CTC at EWTN.com. Pedro Quiles is our producer. Matt Kabinski is our phone screener. Rich Jesse handling social media for us. If you'd like to ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we're streaming on both those platforms right now. Just put your question in the comments box if you would. Again, the phone number 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? I'm doing decent. Thank you. Just realize uh, after and we're, we're coming up on on 10 years it'll be 10 years to do this program in September and that there are still new questions that are coming up that we've never answered before it still happens believe it or not it is absolutely amazing here's a question now from Matteo who says why do some Catholics believe that John the Baptist was born without original sin why is that um well, I, I wasn't aware that Catholics believe that John the Baptist was born without original sin, right? So there are really only two people that would fall into that category. One, of course, would be the Son of God. Sure. And the other would be the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was preserved from uh, any stain of original sin mm -hmm. from the moment of her conception. Now, John the Baptist did receive grace in utero, yeah. but not but not the grace that the Virgin Mary had of the Immaculate Conception. So only only one person... Only one creature had the Immaculate Conception, and that would be the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, he, he contends that some Catholics believe, though, that, that John the Baptist was in that, that little club. That well, little... you know, well, I mean, there, there are probably some Catholics that like hotel food, but that doesn't yeah. mean everybody has to follow them, you know? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Here's one now from uh, Dante who says, how did sainthood get started. Is this one of Christ's instructions, like the Sacrament of Reconciliation, or is it just a human invention? Why is there a need for the Catholic Church to have saints? Okay, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So the idea of venerating the holy dead goes back to before the time of Christ. We find it in Judaism. We find it in the Old Testament. Uh, and it was, it's was it been part and parcel of the people of God, really, under both covenants. And so it has always been a part of the Christian church. And, and the, the way it manifested itself in the earliest days of Christianity was the, was the veneration of the relics of the saints, in particular, the relics of the martyrs. Now, when, when martyrdom ceased to be as common, uh, people began to venerate uh, those who were really martyrs to, to holiness, martyrs to purity, martyrs, you know, they would live lives of heroic charity and asceticism. And, and it, uh, you know, that, that, that's also been a part of the church's tradition from the beginning, and it became a more pronounced part of the tradition. As I said, the, the, you know, the cult of the martyrs became less, uh, less contemporary. And, you know, like, uh, like anything, you can, well, there was a, maybe a little bit of saint inflation, if you will, <laughs> on the part of the people of God, where, you know, maybe there's a, a, a sort of a local cult that emerges around someone who is reputed to be holy, and, uh, and, you know, you, the church would have an interest in making sure that the person being venerated was, say, well, you know, were they orthodox in their theology? Did they really provide an example of holiness that, sh that, that is applicable to the entire Catholic world? Uh -huh. That sort of thing. And so what really began as the spontaneous fervor of the people of God from the ground up gradually took on a more 
uh, institutional character, the local bishop would have overseen it, and eventually the Holy See took that over. And the interest in doing so is that, well, you might you might have a local figure who is well known to people in his own community, and mm-hmm. the, the, the universal church might decide, hey, this person is an ideal example of Christian life that's applicable to the whole people of God, and ought to be made known to everybody in that way. And so it's really convenient. So it's it's sort of it's it serves the purposes of edification for the whole system of canonization as we now have it to have developed. But, you know, in the absence of that development, it's not like Christians wouldn't have venerated the Holy Dead. We've been venerating the Holy Dead from the very beginning. Sure. And uh, thanks, uh, Dante, for your email. And here's this one from Zach. Are we expected to or required to pray to all three persons of the Trinity independently in our prayer or is it okay to have a favorite and pray primarily to that one? Is there a type of prayer that each of the persons of the Trinity is more apt to answer over the other two? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So there are, of course, vocal prayers and liturgical prayers in the Catholic tradition addressed to each of the persons of the Blessed Trinity individually. Uh, but, uh, but the, you know, it's not like... Your prayer is, you know, if you, you know, on, on Mondays I have to talk to the Holy Spirit and Tuesdays I have to talk to God the Son. It, does, it doesn't work that way. Or, or you know, you don't re- sort of restrict your concerns to one or the other. And, uh, and, you know, the purpose of doing it, particularly liturgically, is to highlight the particularity of the persons and their distinctive roles within the mission of redemption and so forth. And so there's, there, there's a theological motive for doing that. It, it serves edification. But in terms of the efficacy of our prayer, Scripture really only gives us one criterion, and that's the holiness of our life, the charity in our hearts, um, our humility and so forth. And, mm. and if God hears the humble, contrite prayer of the faithful soul, however we articulate it. Now, when Christ himself was asked to give us a model of prayer, he gave us the Our Father, and that really is the the, the, both the primordial and the preeminent Christian prayer. So every prayer is to some extent or another modeled after the Our Father. Very good. Zach, thanks so much for your email. And if you would like to send us an email for a future show, here's the address, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. If you're watching us on TV, that's probably the best way to uh, contact the show, ctc at ewtn.com. In a moment, we're going to get to the phones and we'll talk with Carol in Omaha. Let's Listening there on the Great Spirit Catholic Radio. Lines are open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Or you can text the letters EWTN to 58177. Back in a moment with lots more Call to Communion here on EWTN. It's called a communion here on EWTN. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. And we're going to begin today with Carmen. Carmen is in Dallas listening on the great Guadalupe radio, AM 910. Hey there, Carmen, what's on your mind today? Well, I I had a question. Uh, Of course, it is the Feast of John the Baptist. I am Catholic, of course. And uh, I've always had people ask me the question, is John... Some people, some preachers have referred to John the Baptist as a baptizer, and they don't know where, is that a title or is that a last name? Where did he, where did that, did that name come from? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the name as applied to John the Baptist refers to an activity that he was well known to have engaged in, namely uh, uh, subjecting potential disciples to a baptism of repentance as they awaited the coming of the Messiah. That was characteristic of his ministry. John, uh, you know, the the background of John is a little bit hazy. Many scholars think that he was at one time a member of the Essene community, which is a Jewish sectarian and apocalyptic group that was waiting for the coming of kingdom of God. But by all evidences, he seems to have left that if he was a member. We don't know that he was, but there's some evidence that he might have been that he left that community and began to preach more widely to the people of God that they should repent and prepare for the coming kingdom of God and for the arrival of the Messiah. 
and part and parcel of that call to repentance was was uh, the practice of water baptism in the Jordan River. And, you know, the, the, the placement in the Jordan River is rather significant. You know, he didn't call them to his backyard swimming pool and barbecue. <laughs> and when the, Joshua led the people of God uh, into the Promised Land, of course, they crossed the border of the Jordan River into, into the Promised Land. And so by placing himself there and deliberately saying, don't say that we have Abraham for our father because God can raise up children for Abraham from these very stones. It's as if John were saying, I'm, I'm going to mark out through baptism in the Jordan those who are the real children of Abraham and who really deserve to inherit the promise of the, of the, of the promised land in the coming kingdom. Uh, see, he was calling out kind of an elect group, those that would really commit themselves to the rigorous practice of the moral life. And the, the instructions that John gave were uh, really oriented towards the keeping of the Ten Commandments with a kind of rigorous exactitude. That's what char- was characteristic, and baptism was, was how that was expressed. Jesus Christ was uh, part of John's retinue, if you will. He was, he was in and around the ministry of John the Baptist, and and deliberately associates himself with it. He he wants to be understood as continuing John's project and fulfilling it. Mm. And John said of Christ, "I have to become lesser; he has to become greater." So they're mm-hmm. they're involved in the same project, except that Christ was the messianic king that that John merely anticipated. And in Christ's ministry, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was again anticipated by John was actually received in Christ. So the two are are deeply interrelated in their ministry, and the baptism of Jesus, unlike that of John's, was not merely a baptism of repentance, but was one of regeneration, where the gift of the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon believers in Christ. Carmen, thanks so much for your call. David, do you think uh, that John the baptizer would be more grammatically correct rather than John the Baptist? John the Baptist. You know, I, I'm not going to argue with the language of tradition. <laughs> okay. You know, I'm just going to take it as it comes, and 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 we'll you know we'll we'll continue to define our terms. As Sounds we good, them. Carmen. Thanks again for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion here on EWTN in progress. Let's go now to Richard in Ohio, listening on AM 1260, The Rock. Hey there, Richard. What's on your mind today, sir. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Howdy. Um, uh, recently at uh, Mass, uh, the Gospel passage was from Matthew uh, chapter 5 uh, about uh, Jesus uh, saying that uh, uh, if you commit, if you look with lust upon a woman, you commit adultery with her in her heart, in your heart. Um, I, I was thinking, is is it fair for Jesus to put the onus of, uh, of the sin uh, exclusively, of this sin exclusively on men, considering the way women dress today, except except those in the is- Islamic faith, uh, mostly anyone under 40 dresses uh, to avoid using a vulgarism, like Daisy May from Dog Patch. Uh, okay. okay. I, I, got, I got the point. I sure. got the point. So, in other words, is the onus uh, of for this commandment strictly on men, or do women also bear a responsibility for purity of heart? So, uh, let me treat this in kind of a nuanced way, if I could. So, first of all, let's remind ourselves of the teaching of the Catholic Church and Jesus that God commands nothing that is impossible. And when confronted with the rigors of Christ's teaching on <clears throat> marriage and sexuality, the apostles responded rather like rather like you did, and they said, well, if this is the case, it's better for a man not to marry. I mean, this like, seems kind of impossible. And Christ's response to that was, well, with you it is impossible, but with God all things are possible, that with the gift of the Holy Spirit and grace that we really can keep the commands of the Lord. And <clears throat> specifically when it comes to purity of heart, uh, your question puts me in mind of a story uh, that I read about Dietrich von Hildebrand, uh, told by his uh, by his wife Alice, you know, both of whom of happy memory. Uh-huh. Uh, Dietrich, as you may know, was a was a great Catholic moral theologian and philosopher, and uh, he he wrote um, his doctoral dissertation or his Abilitation Schrift, I don't remember which, in uh, when he's doing his PhD studies in in Germany, on uh, on the on the phenomenology of purity. Hmm. And all of his advisors said, 
Uh, Dietrich, that's absolutely nuts. Nobody is going to publish a document, uh, an academic text on purity. But he was very taken with the question of purity. He said, no, that's what I'm going to commit my academic study to. And he, mm-hmm. he wrote on purity, eventually published that book. And uh, and he was very, I mean, that was, he was passionately committed to it and uh, as an academic quest, but also because it was motivated by his own interior disposition. And his wife, Alice, I remember reading one time said that he just would remark, he, he would respond with just revulsion and disgust at the thought of pornography, right? The idea of immodesty and pornography just, it didn't appeal to him. It's not something that he, you know, had to cover his eyes and run away from. It had, it held no appeal for the man. He was, okay. he was nauseated and disgusted by yeah. it. And the, the point is that if you have the, if you have the right interior life, then the 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 more you develop that inner life of virtue and that relationship with God, um, the easier and easier it becomes to resist temptation. Temptation can actually cease to be temptation and can become revulsion. It can become something that you have no desire for whatsoever at all. Um, and uh, and that is, of course, the, the the path that we're all meant to tread. And not, and not von Hildebrand alone, but you find many other characters from the Catholic tradition that have the same experience. St. Thomas Aquinas was reputed to have never suffered a temptation against purity. He had a he had a sort of trial in his young adulthood, and he overcame that trial and was really confirmed in that gift of purity. So it is possible to to do this even in the midst of a deeply immoral generation. And so, um, you know, it would be entirely wrong for me to advise men to say, well, you know, you're really not responsible for your interior life because the women around you are just making it so blooming difficult. Like that would that would be the wrong counsel to give to a man. Now, I also want to to be very careful in what I say about women because it is possible to 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 saddle young girls with the sense that they are personally responsible for the sins of their male colleagues and associates and 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 to feel this tremendous burden of guilt that uh, you know to view men as simply you know sort of predatory oglers who 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 can't control themselves and the whole thing falls on women and and uh, and that's a that can put a great psychological burden on a young woman and I don't I don't want to do that. Yeah. I think the better way to say is that all of us are responsible for our own purity of life. All of us. Uh, we're responsible for our own interior life, and we're responsible for not leading our neighbors into sin and to you know causing them to stumble. Um, but beyond that, I think you know to try to divide the thing up among the sexes and heap a bunch of responsibility on one or a bunch of guilt on the other is really to take the log out of my own eye. And and mm. worry about the speck in my neighbors. Wow. Thank you so much uh, for your call. I remember years ago hearing the term custody of the eyes. There you go. That was very freeing so, yep. for me and, and for our family. Appreciate your call there, Richard. It is called Communion here on EWTN. A couple lines open. Looks like two lines open right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-EWTN. 2883986. Hope is watching us on YouTube today. Hope says, "Could you please explain what happened to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah?" Well, uh, he received a prophecy that his that his wife would conceive and that she would give birth to a son who would be this forerunner to the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Zechariah said. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Not likely, bud. And for his incredulity, of course, he 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 was he was struck dumb until the birth of the child. And then when he rec- he you know wrote his name as John, he received his power of speech back. And yes. then he he gave us his wonderful canticle that we now have as part of the office of readings. I mean, uh, as part of a morning prayer in the, mm-hmm. in, the in the divine office. Mm-hmm. So so basically, you know, the moral of that story is if. Uh, if an angel shows up and with with you know marks of divine authority and tells you something, don't go. Yeah, right. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention. Exactly. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks for watching us. Hope on YouTube. It's called the Communion here on EWTN. An email now from Diego. Is it true to say that faith is necessary for salvation? I know that the church teaches that God extends grace to all, but if faith is necessary, how can non-believers be saved? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the Catholic tradition has, for a long time, distinguished between what we call an explicit faith and an implicit faith. And uh, all of us have an implicit faith to a certain extent. So there, there are things about divine revelation that I don't explicitly know. I mean, I'm, I'm a theologian. I've studied theology and church doctrine for pretty much my whole adult life, and I make an effort to know what the church says so I can affirm it. But 
I learn stuff all the time. You know, I mean, if somebody asked me, could you list every infallible statement that a pope has ever made, you know, from 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 St. Peter to the present? I mean, I know the biggies, but, you know, there's a there's a you know, few things that came out in the 15th century or something that I might be a bit squirrely on. You <laughs> yeah. know? And I, I cannot tell you literally everything that is in, say, every word of the catechism or every mm. page of Denzinger's Enchiridion of Christian doctrine or something. Um, but I know that if the church teaches it, it's true. Right. In the same way, you know, when, before I was Catholic, when I was Protestant, if you said, do you believe the Bible? I would have said, oh, yeah, I believe the Bible. And if you said, OK, Andrews, recite it in Hebrew and Greek from page one. Well, I couldn't have done that. You know, I mean, I had a general idea what it said, but I didn't know every single word of the Bible. But I was pre committed to believing it if it was there. Sure. You see. Sure. Okay. And so all of us are like that. All of us have things about the faith that we implicitly believe. We, we know we'll believe them when we learn them because mm -hmm. we trust the authority of God, but we don't yet have that acquired knowledge. And uh, for some of us, the faith is a lot more implicit than explicit. For mm -hmm. some, it's pretty explicit, but for many, it's, a, 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 it's, it's fairly implicit. Take a baptized baby, for example. A baptized baby has never been to catechism class, probably doesn't know his own name. But does it have the virtue of faith? Well, church says yes. Says yes, has faith. Right now, mm -hmm. well, through through sanctifying grace, uh, the infused virtues, theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, have been poured into that child's heart. So that child has the virtue of faith, although that faith is entirely implicit. It will grow and develop as the child is catechized and grows up, and as it learns the content of the faith, that will say Amen, 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 as it learns more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, but what it has right now is a supernaturally infused disposition to believe everything that God has revealed. Can't wait to find out what that is. Yeah. And so you just extrapolate. You take that, that idea of implicit faith and you apply it across the board to every human being alive to whom God makes the offer of grace. And it's a willingness to believe what God has revealed insofar as I know that God has revealed it. Diego, thanks so much for your email. Here is Bob now driving through Texas listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, Bob. What's on your mind today, sir? Bob in Texas, are you there? Yes, sir. Go right sir, ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you very kindly. I have a question about inspiration, how the Bible was written. I'm, I have a, a driver partner who insists that the apostles and the writers of the, of the uh, Scripture were in some kind of a trance, that they had no idea what was what they were writing, because in his mind and, and in my partner's mind, uh, man can't think, uh, you know, because Paul talks about how all of the wisdom that he learned as a Pharisee was dumb. And so that's how my partner looks at people, you know, that we encounter every day. And he, he kind of judges, <laughs> you know, you know, whether someone is of the spirit or of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that first one is the demonic spirit. And I'm trying to understand how he gets to automatic writing for Scripture. And I thought, well, Dr. David Anders, I bet, knows <laughs> how yeah. the inspiration came and okay. how it was written. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate the question. So your, your, your friend's position, of course, runs flat contrary to the testimony of Scripture about itself. And the different books of the Bible and even different parts of individual books have uh, were composed under different circumstances. And so you really have to distinguish composition from inspiration. Inspiration is something that applies to all of the books of the Bible, but composition, there were different modes of composition. So to take an example, um, St. Luke begins his his uh, two-volume work by saying, I, I engaged in uh, investigative reporting. I went out and interviewed witnesses. I looked at documents. I, I, you know, I poked around and looked under rocks, and I composed the, uh, the best account of the circumstances that have surround the life of Jesus that I'd come up with to hand over to you, Theophilus. Mm -hmm. St. Paul, uh, clearly, in many of his letters, is responding to specific local circumstances. So he gets information about a local church, and he sits down, and he writes out you know, what he has to say. And in places, he even distinguishes his own personal judgment from what he knows about the, the oral teaching of Jesus. And so he relies on different sources. 
I'm running out of time on this call. I might touch on it a little bit after the break, but that's the general idea. There you go, Bob. Thanks so much uh, for your call. We have one line open right now at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion. Do stay with us. Hey, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. We have one line open at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. All right, let's go to uh, Lisa. Lisa is in Michigan listening on Sirius XM, Channel 130. Lisa, what's on your mind today? Hi there. I just wondered if, um, in regards to your uh, mention of the Essenes in an earlier call, do you or the Catholics have any thoughts on the if if the, if the Essenes ever played a role in the life of Jesus in his youth or in his twenties during that time before his public ministry began? Hmm. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So there there seems to be at least one reference to the Essenes in Jesus's teaching. Uh, well, it, it it's a little bit a little bit sketchy, but but it's hard to come up with a better reference. There might be somebody else in mind, but it seems to be the Essenes. And I'll tell you what that is. It's in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus says some people have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Hmm. Who is he talking about? Right? Who is he talking about? Well, the the one contender that we know of in in uh, the the Judaism of Jesus's day was the Essene community did practice celibacy. They were kind of a monastic community, practiced monastic celibacy. So the Pharisees didn't do that. The Sadducees didn't do that. The run of the mill of Judeans didn't do that. So it seems that plausible that he may have been referring to the Essenes. Okay. Um, now, you know, we mentioned earlier that many scholars think that John the Baptist was likely an Essene. Don't know this. You're not obligated to think this is a Catholic. It's just kind of the best historical reconstruction. Uh, who would have left the community and, and done his own thing. And and so there were elements of, well, sort of the Essene ethos, if you will, that may have clung about John's person. And his uh, his his eschatological focus on the kingdom of God, um, his demand for a kind of strict moral conformity and preparation thereof, uh, his use of baptism, and the Essenes were known to have used a, a sort of a you know, a ritual of uh, purification by water, which may, seems to have been the basis of John the Baptist's uh, practice of ritual baptism. And those are elements that definitely do pass over into the teaching of Jesus. Now, no evidence that we can discern that Christ himself was ever a part of the Essene community, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, you can't be, a, just take an example from contemporary American Christianity. You know, you, you couldn't be a, a Christian in the world today, a Christian in North America, and um, and say, you know, not interact with, I don't know, the Catholic thing. Like if you were an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or whatever, well, you know, there's Catholicism sort of looming, right? <laughs> you know, you, you, you're, you're going to be aware of it and it's going to be reflected something, even if it's opposition. You're sure. going to have some kind of consciousness that there is this Catholic thing. Likewise, Catholics that do ministry in North America, they know the Protestant thing is out there. So yes. you just can't be in that environment and not have some kind of resonance in your in your teaching that there are these other folks out there that do this stuff sometimes approving sometimes disapproving so in that sense i think you can you can see the echo of the essene sort of around the new testament but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that all the new testament guys were you know off doing essene things in the in the woods sure, so to sure. speak now the the best most approachable book i know on the topic is by john bergsma and it's called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's a, just a great little book, and it, it it goes into all these questions in some depth. What is the relationship between Jesus and the New Testament and what we know from archaeology and textual finds about the Essene community? Thanks so much for your call, Lisa. It is called a communion here on EWTN. Let's go to uh, Denise now. Denise is a first-time caller in Boston listening on her Alexa device. Hey there, Denise. What's on your mind today? So I often read at Daily Mass. And frequently there is a person from the congregation who initiates the St. Michael prayer after, after Mass. mass. Uh -huh. she, she does so rather aggressively. Am I being rude if I leave my place in the pew before the prayer is finished? Okay, thanks. So let's be clear. You are now asking for my personal opinion. 
as a as a as a human being in the pew. Yes. So I am not in any shape, form, or fashion speaking in an authoritative way about quote the Catholic position in quote. Got it. Just my personal opinion. Okay. Right? Um, so I know what you mean about people who are aggressive with their devotional life, and you can you can be around folks, and there's almost a sense that what you're not going to join me in my favorite prayer, and if you don't, you're a terrible bad person, <laughs> all in caps. Like I I realize that, and I don't personally see. Uh, nothing against the St. Michael prayer, but I don't feel the necessity of conforming my life of prayer to someone else's expectations if it's not something that's required by the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and if I have a legitimate reason to skid out a lot of there, if I got to get to work or something, I'm not going to personally, I'm not going to scruple about that. I happen to like the St. Michael prayer. I pray it all the time. I mean, it's been a part of my practice and I, I, I advocate for it. But, yeah, you're not obligated to. Um, now, at the same time, you know, I'm sensitive to the consciences of others. St. Paul said, you know, I'm, I can eat meat, not eat meat, do whatever I want to do. But I, if, if it's going to cause my brother to sin, then I'll, you know, I'll refrain from eating meat, which mm. in his day meant meat sacrificed to idols. Right, right. That principle applied today is, yeah, I have freedom in my, in my religious and devotional life, but I don't want to let my freedom be an occasion for somebody else to fall into sin. So, you know, I'm not going to put a big neon sign over my head going, I don't have to be here and stomp out, you know, with on my telephone or something and draw attention to myself. But yeah, I mean, you're not, I don't think you're rude if you need to get out of there. I mean, when, once we've had the dismissal, you know, you can go. Um, personal opinion. Okay. Well, there you go. Plus it's under 30 seconds. It's not a long prayer. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It it's is not a short. long prayer. Very good. And uh, thank you so much uh, for your call today, Denise. Now that's something that comes after the Mass at many parishes. Right. Here's a question about something that comes before the Mass at many parishes. This is an email from Lauren. Why do Catholics often pray the rosary before Mass starts? Yeah, thanks. So let's draw a distinction here, if we can, between the Church's liturgy and the Church's devotional life. Okay. The liturgy are those things that were instituted by Christ, those, li- those rituals that were instituted by Christ, principally the seven sacraments, mm which includes, of course, the Mass and the Eucharist, but it's not the other, others beside, as well as the public prayer of the Church that we call the Divine Office. And the Church imposes obligations on Catholics with respect to the practice of these things. So all Catholics are required to uh, uh, participate in the sacraments that are appropriate to their state of life. So you have to be baptized, you have to be confirmed, need to receive uh, communion that first time, and then, of course, at least once a year, you have to go to confession. Um, Should you choose to marry, you need to marry in the church. Uh, You know, if you want to be a priest, you need the sacrament of ordination. And so, uh, and if you're, if you're uh, on your way out, you you really want to avail yourself of the, of the sacrament of, uh, of holy unction, of holy anointing. So you got to do those things. Now, if you're a priest or religious, you're also required to pray the divine office. Lay people can, of course, but they're not required to. So those are the requirements. Outside of the requirements for the life of prayer, oh, we should also say in a general sense, all Catholics are obligated to pray in the privacy of their interior life, but the form that that takes will be variable. Some will pray this way, some will pray that, but you need to pray. You do some kind of prayer. Principally, the Lord's Prayer ought to be in there somewhere. Uh, Beyond what's required by the church, uh, both in the specifics of the liturgy and the general sense, um, there's a bagazillion chameleon different ways you could pray. And, and that encompasses what we call the devotional life of the church. And there are th- literally thousands of devotional prayers that a person can take up. And you do so according to your own lights about what would be edifying in your circumstance. And in different parts of the church, different traditions uh, take hold. So in the Latin church, the rosary is probably the single most popular devotional prayer outside the liturgy. In the Eastern Church, not so much, but in the Western Church, the liturgy, I mean, the the rosary is tremendously popular and highly commended to us by Pope upon Pope upon Pope. I mean, I can't tell you how many encyclicals have been published on the liturgy, how many books have come out, I mean, not the liturgy, on on uh, on the rosary, and the saints that have advocated for it. So it's an edifying prayer, many Catholics are drawn to it, and it seems to be kind of a badge of Catholic identity for for Latin, Latin right Catholics. And I would encourage you to explore the rosary in terms of, you know, why do Catholics uh, sometimes pray the rosary before mass? Well, the, you know, the, here's a principle that everyone should follow, and that's prepare yourself for mass. Yes. 
prepare yourself for mass. Now that could take different forms. That could mean maybe I spend uh, 15 minutes doing an examination of conscience. That could mean, you know, maybe I simply take a few moments and bow my head and invite the Lord's presence into my life and try to make myself more conscious of, of God and his call on my life and the gospel before I go to mass, whatever it might be, uh, you know, tie my shoes, straighten my hair, you name it, just get ready for mass so that you're in the proper disposition to receive all that you can receive. Now, many Catholics have found it to be very edifying and helpful to pray the rosary as that preparation. Okay. Are you required to? No, you're not. But in your parish, if that's standard practice, uh, then I'd invite you to consider it. You're not obligated, but hey, go check it out. Absolutely. Lauren, thanks so much uh, for your email. Again, the address, if you'd like to send us an email, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Glad you're with us for Call to Communion. Here is Bob in Abilene, Texas, listening on the Ave Maria radio app. Hey there, Bob. What's on your mind today, sir? Uh, yeah, so sometimes, sometimes you'll hear from, from Protestant scholars that they really don't have any use for the spiritual senses of Scripture, um, and especially like the allegorical sense. Um, so as Catholics, as as we go back and read early church fathers' readings, especially with an allegorical sense, how do we know when they have actually exited the literal sense and they just made a wrong turn, maybe over-spiritualized it? Uh, how do we know that? Yeah, what a fantastic question. So, um, uh, first of all, the spiritual sense of the text is absolutely essential. It's absolutely essential. And this is not just something that Catholics have made up. It is the teaching of the New Testament itself. And so St. Paul is explicit in his first letter to the Corinthians, that, and, and 2 Corinthians too, for that matter, that the letter of the, of the Scriptures leads to death. That's really strong language, but the Spirit gives life. And he knew this from his own experience, right? This was borne out in his own case because Paul was, you know, something of a—this is an acronistic term, but basically kind of a fundamentalist, if you will, about his reading of the Old Testament. It said things like, uh, you know, if you catch a woman in adultery, you need to stone her to death. If you find a Sabbath breaker, you need to stone him to death. And and uh, he was big into stoning people to death. And he, he looked around, saw these early Christians that were causing all kinds of a ruckus, and he thought they were going to impede the arrival of the kingdom of God. So he said, all right, everybody, pick up your stones. Let's get to work. And he was complicit in the murder of Christians, right? Because he took that those sort of commands in the Old Testament quite literally, quite at face value. Jesus didn't. In, emphatically, he didn't. I mean, when, when Jesus was often confronted with the literal sense of Old Testament legislation, he said, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to stone adulterers, and, uh, and, uh, and we're not going to permit men to divorce their wives for any reason, notwithstanding the fact that the Old Testament says otherwise. And the disciples and the Pharisees were like, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, that, how, how can you relate to the Bible if you don't take it in those terms? And he said, well, there's a higher principle. You know, in the case of marriage is what God did from the beginning. And these other things were what Moses instituted because of your hardness of heart. So he kind of relativized some portions of the Old Testament in view of higher spiritual principles. And Paul takes that to an even higher degree. And he says, it's impossible to understand the Old Testament, to apply it to one's life properly if one lacks the Spirit of God. And he explicitly invokes allegory in the book of Galatians uh, to, uh, to interpret the life of, of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. And so the idea that you can dispense with the spiritual sense is really to dispense with the New Testament teaching about the Old. You just, you can't do that, right? And uh, you can't do that and be faithful to the New Testament. Mm. And what the, the, the Protestant impulse to do that is because they want to turn the Bible into something that it is not. Uh, in, in especially, particularly in 19th century Reformed Protestantism, what, what would become fundamentalism, uh, they, they were really insistent that the Bible is a kind of um, uh, data source that gives us a comprehensive, although somewhat disorganized, collection of everything that a person would need to know about God or the spiritual or the moral life. And Charles Hodge, in his systematic theology, his Protestant theologian of the time, explicitly teaches. He says, well, the job of theology is basically to arrange the propositional content of the Bible in some sort of systematic order, and then voila, you have the will of God on this matter. Mm. And so it was actually explicitly modeled after the Baconian conception of natural science. If you've ever gone back and watched uh, you know, movies about the 19th century naturalists, if you ever saw the Russell Crowe movie, Master and Commander, you remember there's a, the ship's doctor who is an amateur naturalist. And when he's not 
you know, amputating people's arms and legs, he's running around the Galapagos, you know, yes. collecting samples and then sketching them out. This is the kind of activity that Charles Darwin was engaged yeah, in. You know? yeah. And that was a big thing if you were, a, you know, a guy with, with means in the 19th century and you were British or whatever, you would go around and collect samples and try to collate all this data and arrange it into some sort of systematic order. Well, that's that was explicitly the model that 19th century Protestants took and said, well, what you do with the natural world, we're, we're not doing that with the Bible. We're trading it as this sort of data set. And they wanted it to be seen as a kind of analog to natural science. And eventually it came to be seen as a kind of competitor to natural science. If my set of facts and your set of facts would seem to conflict, well, then so much the worse for your set of facts. And hence, you know, the alleged conflict between between religion and science that led to things like, you know, the Scopes monkey trial and all that. Yeah. All of that is born out of a really unbiblical view of the Bible, namely that the Bible is this assemblage of propositions that have to be systematically ordered and exegeted and then voila you have you know the rule of faith that god wants the church to have the problem with that is that that's just not what the bible says about itself <laughs> it's not what the church says about the bible and it's it's manifestly false on the face of it if you look at the individual texts of scripture according to their genre i mean the biggest fattest book of the bible is a book of hymns it's the psalms I mean, who on earth could treat the Psalms as if the point of the Psalms was to give us an assemblage of random facts? I mean, the whole th the, 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 the thing is absurd on the face of it, yeah, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so on with the narratives as well. You can just take genre after genre. None of them present themselves that way. So you have to address the spiritual sense of the Bible. You have to interpret texts according to their genre. And you, in, in order to treat the whole thing as a canon, it has to be organized by a higher principle as Christ himself illustrated. And for Christians, that principle is the person of Jesus himself. That's the way you approach the Bible. Hmm. Um, and so w when I dialogue with Protestants, I really don't want to have a debate that's merely exegetical. That is to say, let's just confine our discussion to the propositional content of the Bible, because to do so, I think, is to concede the Protestant view of the Bible, which I dispute, which the Catholic Church disputes. I think a better conversation to have is, how does God reveal his will to us? Is it this way that you say it is? Is it through the propositional content of the Bible alone? Uh, I, I dispute. I don't think that's how it works. Mm. I don't think that's what Scripture says about itself. I don't think reason reveals that at all. All right. And Bob, thanks so much for checking in from Abilene. Called a communion here on EWTN. Back in January of this year, we added onto the EWTN radio schedule what has proven to be a very, very popular program, Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year. We air that uh, tonight and every night at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN radio. Father Mike Schmitz guides you through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 episodes. You know, if you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be a Catholic and to allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. Check it out tonight and every night, 10 p.m. Eastern, Bible in a Year, Catechism of the Year, in a Year on EWTN Radio. All right, let's go to a Catherine in San Francisco, listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, Catherine, what's on your mind today? Yeah, I have a question. If a marriage from God went about to unsolve, make both into trouble and letting go is a mortal and genius thing for me. During the break of divorce and how many can you differentiate why that? And please do make me understand it's very painful painful to my part if really happens it for me. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I didn't hear the whole question. It was a little bit garbled, but yeah. I'm gonna restate what I think you're asking. So this is a question about the morality of marriage. And in particular, the morality of divorce, if one is in a, a presumptively in a, a sacramental marriage. Uh -huh. So here's what the church teaches. And first of all, let me say that I'm really, really sorry for the failure of the marriage here and the, and the pain that that is inevitably going to cause. I mean, my heart goes out to you, and I, I want you to know that I'm compassionate for your situation. Um, but in terms of what the church teaches... When we make a vow of marriage, the presumption is that we will remain together. In Christ says, what God has joined together, let man not separate. But there are exceptions. There are exceptions that Scripture recognizes. And there are situations where, uh, for example, and that the church recognizes, where one spouse 
ceases to be capable of living in a kind of moral unity with the other. So let's take, I mean, this may not be your situation, but you can think of analogies. Let's take a situation where you have a Catholic couple, and they have children together maybe, and then uh, one spouse comes in one day and says, well, well, I've changed my mind, and I I hate the Catholic faith, and I hate God and Jesus and the saints and the liturgy, and I'm going to do everything in my power to destroy the faith of our children because I don't want them to go to the Catholic Church. And they may not say it explicitly like that, but their behavior conveys that message. Well, it, it becomes impossible to do one's duty to one's children in that situation, right? And so that would be a, that would be a ground for separation of the, 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 the scandal, uh, you know, the moral corruption of the kids. A um, uh, spouse comes home and, uh, and, and starts uh, becoming a notorious alcoholic or an addict, bringing, say, drugs into the home or or, uh, you know, bringing one's uh, illicit relationships, paramours, adulterous liaisons, that sort of thing, into the house, doing all that in front of the, the wife and the children. Um, terrible scandal. Well, that's another situation where the church says, well, you got to get out of there for the moral preservation of your own soul and that of the kids. Or, um, you know, let's say a spouse has become physically violent um, and your life is in danger or your physical safety is in danger or that of your children. That's another situation. You may have to get out of there. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, a spouse who would be, uh, say, totally wrapped up in the use of pornography without any intention to repent or reform his or her life and scandalizing the family. I mean, th- these kinds of situations happen, and you could think of others as well, where the wounded party who, who didn't choose this, it's not the wounded party's fault, doesn't want this situation, is unable to change the offending party and, and has to get out of there for for his or her safety or the safety of the family. So all, all those are, are a reason. And there are others besides. There are others besides. But those are some that you might consider. Um, you know, when a spouse abandons you and, and sort of runs off with somebody else, and, uh, uh, you know, it would be a reason why you might need to seek the safety or the protection of a civil divorce. Now, though the church says these situations occur, the mere fact of, of seeking a civil divorce is not necessarily a sin, but nor does it necessarily sever the bonds of a valid marriage. And so there are situations where a person has to seek a civil divorce and yet understands themselves to remain validly married. It's just they no longer live with their spouse. Mm, yeah. In that situation, the person would not remarry, but they would get protection from the abuser. There are other situations, however, where what you think is a valid marriage— you have to leave for one of these reasons. Mm-hmm. And then when you submit the matter to the church for judgment, the church says, well, lo and behold, we looked into it and we decided you weren't ever really married to begin with. What you thought was a sacramental marriage really wasn't a sacramental marriage because there were some deficits in there, some defects that you didn't know about at the time. And that declaration is called a declaration of nullity or receiving an annulment. So my advice to anybody, if they've had to go through a divorce that they didn't want to, ask the church for an annulment, let the marriage tribunal look at your situation. They may come back and tell you, you know what? You weren't validly married to begin with anyway, in which case, not only was it not wrong of you to divorce, it was the right thing to do because you weren't validly married to begin with. Sure. So go ahead and approach the priest at your parish, tell them about your situation, address the possibility of an annulment. That's what it's there for. Catherine, thanks so much uh, for your call today from San Francisco. Uh, Joey called, couldn't stay on the line, but he said, Dr. Anders, a surprisingly well-meaning Protestant friend, said that Scripture says Jesus does not care about the flesh in heaven. Therefore, Mary is no different from any other person in heaven. Where do I go from here in our discussion? Well, um, so Scripture doesn't say that Jesus doesn't care about the flesh in heaven, for one. So, you know, the burden of proof is the one on his, who asserts. And, That's right. And you, it, I, I can tell you one thing, Scripture doesn't assert that, right? <laughs> so there, there, there are some passages of Scripture that talk about the flesh. Uh, and so he may be thinking of this one when Jesus says, it's the spirit that gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. There's no reference there to heaven, but mm-hmm. Christ does say that. But in what sense does the flesh count for nothing? Um, when St. Paul uses the word flesh, he can use the word sometimes to refer to this mortal body. But other times he uses the word to refer to 
the, the principle of corruption that's in us through original sin, right? The tendency to concupiscence or pride or malice or egotism or whatever, that's, that's not a feature of our embodiment, uh-huh. but is a feature of our fallen condition. Now, in that sense, you know, the flesh needs some tidying up to be sure, right? Yeah. But in terms of the eternal destiny of the flesh, I mean, it's emphatically taught by Christ and all the apostles that the flesh that we have will be raised from the dead and glorified with Christ if we are in the state of grace, the bodily resurrection from the dead is the eternal destiny of every saved person. So you can't say the flesh counts for nothing if God intends to preserve it for eternity. All right. Joey, thanks for your call. And in 30 seconds, David, here's one from Susan on YouTube. Dr. Anders, can you explain the difference between mental prayer and contemplative prayer? The terms are used variously in the Catholic tradition, but one way of distinguishing them would be mental prayer is is the spontaneous prayer of your heart that's not tied down or restricted restricted to words composed by someone else. Uh And contemplative prayer is an infused, that is a supernatural state, whereby one comes to participate, to know in a kind of participatory way, the truths of the faith that one previously only knew intellectually. So, you know, it's one thing to know that, that say, I might know in my mind that Jesus loves me, It's another thing to know in a kind of deep interior experience that the love of God sort of penetrates my life so that my whole perspective is transformed. You know, that's approaching the contemplative state, not just an intellectual state. Mental prayer is an important part of of contemplative practice because you have to kind of develop that interior life. A great writer on mental prayer and contemplative prayer is Jacques Philippe. I highly recommend his books, his his book, Time for God. Great introduction to these subjects. Susan, thanks for checking in on YouTube. Dr. David Andrews. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. Check us out next time here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Until then, I'm Tom Price. Have a wonderful day. We will see you next time. God bless.